What I'd like to do is introduce you to my racing career through a video. In this video, you'll see the evolution of my hairstyles. And you, it starts back in 1994 when I was just a few years out of high school and in the beginning stages of my racing and takes you a little bit through my journey. When I was about seven or eight, I can remember standing here and saying, I want to drive a race car someday. Lady and gentlemen, start your engine. <laughs> I don't know if it's the freedom, you can, you know, just put the hammer down and go as fast as you can go. Just like an adrenaline rush, it just gives you that feeling that one of the best things that could happen to you. Like many kids, Jennifer Cobb wanted to be like her dad. She wanted to race cars and win trophies like he has for 19 years. I mean, everybody says they want to do something, but racing is such a sacrifice. I mean, you've got to sacrifice everything else to do your racing. But Jennifer Cobb wasn't going to let the sacrifice, nor the fact that she was a woman in a male-dominated sport, defeat her. Right now, I'm a local race car driver, but everybody has to start somewhere, and I would like to go straight to the top. And with determination like Jennifer's, the top may be exactly where she's headed. You ready? I'm ready. <laughs> Jennifer Joe Cobb finishes a strong ninth. Obviously, I want to, you know, try to go up further and, and you know, I want to race. <laughs> we set a goal out to finish at least in the top ten, so goal accomplished, you know, that always feels good. And, of course, with the rain, you always wonder, could we have been top five maybe, you know, as we were improving a little bit. But uh, real, real happy to bring the Nick and Willie's Take and Bake Pizza Chevrolet home in ninth. She didn't leave nothing, leave nothing on the table in that first lap, Phil. She definitely went for it. She had that big slide over there, and mm -hmm. she kept kept her foot in it. Obviously, look at this tracker now, running about a tenth of a second bat better than Mike Harmon's lap. Let's see if she can get through three and four this time. Looks like pretty how, good this how time. How exciting would it be to be able to be on a provisional pole, at least for a short period of time? Hometown girl here. She's going to, I'm too. I'm telling you right now, that's a, that was a much, much better lap. Great lap much, for much Jennifer Joe Cobb. 31.53. The speed can reach over 190 miles an hour. The temperature inside the race car, 150 degrees. Despite those extremes and the usual fire-spitting crashes, Jennifer Joe Cobb feels right at home on the NASCAR racetrack. This up-and-coming driver is paving the way for aspiring female racers and making quite a name for herself. You know, I think um, every child has a big dream. And at three years old, my mom put me into dance classes. And at three years old, my dad started driving race cars. And, you know, dance was wonderful, served a great purpose for my life. But I'm not going to grow up and be a ballerina. I feel like God planted a seed in my heart. And hmm. at eight years old, in my father's garage, I said, I want to be a race car driver. And the reaction was like, you know, rolling of the eyes and shaking of the head and, okay, go along now. You know, go somewhere else. We're busy working on your dad's car for Friday night. Get loose and shot up in front of Johnny Chapman. That flash fire went out as they stop here. Hmm. Pretty significant fire. Wow. Great pickup for you guys from practice. Tell us about your lap. And have you had, had time to assess the damage on this car? If you make the show, what's going to be the plan? I think it's okay. Um, we have this great graphic sponsor called Horse Graphics, so we're going to need some 13 sent to Phoenix, please. Um, <laughs> you know what? If we don't make this race, my guys and girls might not get payroll next week. And you get away from qualifying, you scratch your head, and you go, could I have done better? Should I have done more? And now I know. I, I gave it all I had, and I don't regret it. Preparation, dedication, you just really have to want it. There have been many ups and downs, and it's been an incredible journey. But I can tell you, we won't stop until we've made it to the top. And I'd just like to thank those who have been along for the ride. Uh, yeah, up. <laughs> Always up, right? Well, thank you very much. It uh, means a lot to me that you would come out and spend your evening with us here at the USMC. And it's obviously a, a really big journey for me to be here in Moscow and a quite a pleasurable one. I've had about 24 hours in the city and I'm very pleasantly surprised. 
And so I can't wait to share with my friends and my fans back in the U.S. as we do all the time on social media. So if you want to join in the conversation, please feel free. I, as you saw, had this dream to be a race car driver because my dad was a race car driver. When I was three years old, mom put me in dance classes, and when I was three years old, dad started racing on dirt tracks. As I grew up, my mom would yell at me and she would say, you are the only ballerina going to dance class with grease under her fingernails because you're playing with your dad's race car and his tools. And so I was always in trouble, no matter which side I was on. As I got older, I'd go to the racetrack and I was criticized, well, you're the only race car driver who wears makeup inside of my helmet pads. There's makeup all over it. And I say, you know, I am who I am. I love makeup, I love fast cars, and I will do me and you do you. And as you can imagine, being unique, being one of the only women, a lot of times the only woman on the racetrack, everything is criticized. So when I do well, everybody really notices and yay and oh my gosh. And then when I do bad, it's of course very much highlighted. And as things in life tend to sometimes go wrong more than they go well, especially in NASCAR race car driving, that can be very difficult. It, can, it has been a very difficult journey, but a very rewarding journey at the same time. When I was 18 years old, I had my very first opportunity to drive race cars on the local racetrack. So this was a half a mile oval. The surface was asphalt. And it was a four-cylinder pony stock class is what they called it. That it means nothing to me. It probably means nothing to you. But I drove a Mustang. It was a four-cylinder Ford Mustang. But we ran approximately 9,000 RPMs. So this little Mustang was so souped up that it would vibrate so much. I can remember my gear shift, we would have a caution. When we race and take the green flag, we start races in second gear. By the time we get almost to the turn, we're in third gear. And before we get out of the first turn, we're in fourth gear, and we keep it in fourth gear the rest of the time. The only time we have to downshift on most of our races on the big ovals is if there's a caution. And a caution would come out and I would go to downshift and, and my gear shifter would be gone. It had vibrated off because of the massive amount of RPMs in those little race cars. And that was when I was 18 years old. And I started winning races and doing well. And my dad told me, he said, listen, if you're going to be a race car driver, you're going to work on the race cars. Now, I was never a math girl. I was never a big engineering girl. I liked to speak, I liked to write. Uh, but my dad said, you have to put in the time, you have to show me, you have to sacrifice. This is a big deal and a big privilege to get to be a race car driver. So for the first 10 years of my racing career, at the time it was not a career, it was just a hobby, but for those first 10 years, I, would, I worked harder probably than I work now because I was going to college, I was working a full-time job, and then I was working on the race car until midnight or 1 a.m. or sometimes we would get no sleep at all just to make it to the local racetrack, no fame, no glory, no money, on Friday and Saturday nights. And that was the first 10 years of my adulthood. And I can remember when we were having some struggles. Everybody that worked on my race team were volunteers. And I wrecked five or six weeks in a row. And I finally went up to my dad one day and I said, Dad, I'm, I'm going to do us all a favor and I'm going to quit racing. And I thought my dad was going to be so relieved because my parents didn't have a lot of money. My dad owned a small little two garage auto mechanic repair shop. And my mom worked on a factory assembly line. And my parents had to make great sacrifices for me to race. And I still didn't have all of the money that a lot of my competitors race. Most race car drivers are rich. Most race car drivers that I compete against now they come from a family who has a lot of money. So I was very different. I never had a lot of money, but I had a really excellent father who was a race car driver who could teach me things. And so I said, Dad, I'm going to quit. I'm going to do us all a favor. And he looked at me, and he actually looked very angry with me, and I was a little bit scared for the moment. Had a lot of respect for my parents, and so they could scare me. And he said, you are not quitting. He said, you don't quit because it's hard. You don't quit because times are tough. You don't quit when things are difficult. He said, we're going to keep rebuilding this race car no matter how many times you wreck it because the wrecks really weren't my fault. I'm not just saying that. 
Uh, I think he would have told me, yes, kid, you, you, you can't drive. <laughs> Maybe it's time to quit. The stupid things were happening. And these stupid things were like, uh, somebody over-tightened the hose clamp on the radiator hose, and it wore a hole in it, and it sprayed water all over my front tires, and I had no control, and I hit the wall. Another car, we were going three wide into the corner, and so that means there was somebody over here, and there was somebody over here, and I was in the middle, and there's only room for two cars. So I was in the middle, so I was fine. Well, the guy on the outside was never going to back down for a girl. So, of course, all three of us crashed, and we hit the wall. There's all of these different things that were happening, and I'm like, Dad, we can't keep doing this. I know you and Mom don't have the money to rebuild these race cars, so I'm going to quit. And he taught me the number one lesson that I've ever learned in life, and he said, you don't quit because it's hard. When we get the race car rebuilt and you go out and you win a race, that's when I'll let you quit. Who's going to go out like quitting when you won a race, you know? So I continued to race and for 10 years I raced the local tracks and then they built a big NASCAR racetrack in my hometown of Kansas City. And they call it the Kansas Speedway. And I was in college at the time and so I was studying I had to figure it out, like, okay, what, what can make me better at racing? The answer is money. The answer is always money. And if you have it, great. If you don't have it, you know, you feel like you're never going to get it, right? And so I thought, okay, how do I get money? So you see these race cars, and you see these uniforms, and you see these companies that are on the uniforms. And it's business. It's just business. So I went to school to study marketing and sales and promotions and journalism. And so when they built the Kansas Speedway, I had these skills that I had learned from university and I had the racing knowledge. And so when they built a big racetrack in my hometown, the local TV station wanted a spokesperson to be on TV and to talk about racing. So it was perfect. The world's just all kind of came together and that allowed me, that gave me something better to sell for sponsorships. I can remember the first sponsorship that I sold by myself. I had the audacity to call a company and I said, one of your competitors is on one of my competitors' race cars and I think you're a better company and I think I'm a better driver. I probably didn't say that, that just sounds good. But I said, uh, I think you're a better company, I really think that you should be on my race car. What do you think? And when I called, a very important part of that was the lady that answered the phone became my biggest ally, my best friend, my best asset. I said, what is your name? I didn't just, it wasn't about me. I wanted her to feel comfortable giving me the information that I needed. What is your name? Well, this is what I'm wondering. And I explained my situation to her. I made her a race fan right then and there. And she said, I think that's fantastic. I'm gonna make sure this lady calls you back. The lady called me back, I went in, I pitched the presentation, and the next thing you know, I had my first five-figure sponsorship. That allowed me to race at the big Kansas Speedway, and from there, I just really had a determination and never looked back and knew that this is what I was really meant to be doing. For the next nine years was a struggle. Can you imagine? I mean, I'd already been racing for 10 years, right? So the next nine years, are, are a big struggle. And so I got this job at the Richard Petty Driving Experience and I was driving people around racetracks in race cars with two seats all over the country. And I met so many great people. And I can remember it was 2004 now, which is the, the blue car that you saw in the video, one of my fastest race cars I ever drove. That thing that was really cool. I had three races in it. And out of 40 cars, I finished in the top 10 all three times. So it was a really, really good car. And I remember right before I had the opportunity to race that car, I was working at the Richard Petty Driving Experience. And I remember one day I was racing, I was getting opportunities to race maybe one time a year because I gave up racing locally just to race nationally in the big leagues of NASCAR. And I was walking back to my car at the end of the day we had to get down on our hands and knees and take these little brushes and scrub the bugs off of the front of the cars. Like at the drivers, we, we cleaned our own cars. And it was a really hot, dirty job. I lost a lot of weight because I sweated it off working 12 hour days. And I was down in the dumps and I had my head down and a guy that I worked with that had been a big NASCAR driver, he retired. 
he came up to me and he said, what's wrong? And I said, I think it's time for me to quit racing. I said, I, I think I need to do something else. And he said, well, why do you say that? And I said, well, I said, there's just nothing happening. There's no opportunities. What am I doing with my life? What am I going to do? He goes, it's not time to quit yet. This was the second time that I seriously considered quitting. Within a month, I had the opportunity to race that blue car at Chicagoland Speedway in Chicago, at the Kansas Speedway again, which was my home track. I raced it at the Nashville Speedway. Nashville's a very up-and-coming American city. I don't know if you guys have heard of it, but it's a really popular city right now. So I was racing at these three huge racetracks, and by the end of that year was when you saw the very beginning of the video where it says, lady and gentlemen, start your engines. That day, I was in my first big league NASCAR race, the same year that I said, I think it's time for me to quit. And so that day, the emotions that overcome you the first time you're on these big tracks, the first time I was at Talladega, you have to have such a mental focus when you race, and you're sitting there next to somebody famous. I run races next to some of the, the biggest you know, names in NASCAR and which they come down to my level to race so <laughs> but um but you know you win it you win races with these big guys and you're like oh my gosh i can't believe you know kyle bush is right beside me he's like one of the world's greatest race car drivers and here i am at talladega and you just have to pull it together and focus and one thing that my dad taught me at a very early age when i was racing local he said jennifer your mind will start wandering all over the place um, we, have you heard of ADD, the Attention Deficit Disorder? A lot of race car drivers have ADD. And he said, your mind is going to wander all over the place. You'll start just thinking about this or that, believe it or not. And he said, you have to find a way to stay focused. There's times today when I get nervous, and sometimes my car, my truck isn't running right, or they've made a big change. They've taken a big swing at the setup, there's so many, there are hundreds of thousands of combinations of changes that we can change on these race cars from a technical perspective. Every corner, you can put a different spring in. When you settle on that one spring on the suspension, you can actually put what we call spring rubbers into one of the coils or two spring rubbers. The shocks have about 10 different adjustments that you can make on the shocks. I was practicing in Charlotte last Friday night and I said, when I go into the corner, the car is good, but it just wants to start pushing. You know, have you ever took a corner too fast and your car drifts out? We call that pushing. Or in Europe, they call it understeer. And so you're turning, but your, your car doesn't want to turn. It's tight. My crew chief took just a pound of air out of the right front tire, and it made such a big change. So when your crew works on your car, because it's not very good, and you have to go out there and maybe make one lap as fast as you could go in qualifying, you get very nervous. And we were talking earlier, uh, you know, with some of the younger students, and like, what, what are you thinking about? You know, what do you do? What emotions do you feel? What do you do when you get nervous? And there's two things. Number one, when I'm on track and I find I need to focus, I remember something that my dad told me long ago, which is smooth is fast. So as a race car driver, to be very smooth on the wheel. So when I go into the corners and I really have to go really fast and not lift out of the throttle and turn left and not use the brakes, I think, okay, fast and smooth, fast and smooth. And just saying that over and over just keeps me in my zone. It keeps me focused. And, and you know, nine times out of 10, it works out really, really well. <laughs> Every once in a while, what's going to happen is going to happen. But when I get nervous, I just think to myself, I am exactly where I'm supposed to be right now. I love that saying. And you know when is a good time to remember that saying? When you're stuck in traffic. <laughs> I am exactly where I'm meant to be right now. It's difficult, <laughs> but it's very true. Because have you ever had something happen in life that you felt like was from God or you know, from, from the earth, from the universe, that like, there's no way, like really, that's such a coincidence. And so I always tell myself, the next person I meet is coincidentally going to sit, be sitting next to me on an airplane, and that's going to be my next big sponsor or investor into my race team. You're exactly where you're meant to be right now. 
And it's very difficult whenever you are, maybe uh, you think you're supposed to be somewhere else or you're supposed to be getting there faster. But I, uh, I got that saying from a woman who loaned me her car to run to the grocery store real quick while we were out of town racing. And she had it taped on a post-it note in her mirror. And so I think that to keep yourself grounded because life is constantly trying to throw you reasons to veer off course. And so you have to just learn how to bring yourself back in and to keep yourself focused. So I didn't quit in 2004. But after that, not much was happening. <laughs> again, I wasn't getting a lot of opportunities. I had done some really cool things again. I had a big sponsor and I flew to New York City and I had this photo shoot with a world renowned photographer. His name is Nigel Barker. And he was just this big deal, big deal photo shoot. And then within two months, the whole business deal fell apart. They had paid for everything. Very few people have seen those photos and the whole thing fell apart. All of a sudden, I had no opportunities again. So what do we do? It's probably not meant to be. Do you ever tell yourself that? Something bad happens to you or something you wanted goes away and you say, oh, I guess it wasn't meant to be. It just wasn't meant to be. So I was really struggling with that because my passion was to be a race car driver. And I remember going to a counselor for the first time in my life other than school. I sought out a counselor. And I said, well, I said that if I hadn't made it big, by the time I was 35 years old, I'm going to quit racing. And he said, okay, you said that or you can't race you know, after 35? I said, no, I, uh, that's the deal I made with myself. If I haven't made it professionally, full time in NASCAR, by the time I'm 35 years old, I'm gonna quit, it's time to find something else to do. He said, well, how old are you now? And I said, 33. And he was like, so why are you here? You still have two years. And I just had such an aha moment when he said that. Like, I'm, sp I'm gonna spend my next two years worrying about the fact that I have to quit pursuing my passion because Dummy me came up with that brilliant idea, right? So 35 came and went. Still wasn't happening. I was still working for what, the Richard Petty driving experience. I was still, you know, like an amusement park, giving people rides around racetracks. And when I turned 37 years old, I had the opportunity to start racing full time. And I never dreamed that I would be a team owner, but I became a NASCAR team owner. I own the team that I race for. Thank you. So imagine, again, a third opportunity to quit, three big times that I told myself in life that I was going to quit. But after every single time that I pushed through that difficult moment, that's when something big happened. I used to joke, I'm just going to say I'm going to quit, so God will put something really big in my lap right now. <laughs> hey, let's quit, walk away. <laughs> um, but I don't do that anymore. I try to remember those lessons. And, and when I'm going through something difficult, as I feel like I usually am, it's very hard to be a team owner without money. It's very hard to go to the racetrack. So I'll give you a little bit of the, the numbers, okay? Four tires. So one set of tire for my race car, which I should say race truck, but I'm not sure. I think that it, it would, you would get a different vision over here when I say truck. So my race car, four tires cost $2,500. NASCAR allows us six sets of tires per race. Do I have any students that want to do 2,500 times six? Is that about $12,000 or more? Okay, you guys are making me do the math. 10,000 is four sets. $15,000 on tires that are going to last for maybe 40 or 50 laps, right? So I can't afford that. I can't do that. That's not how I get to race. I buy one set of tires, and then all the other big teams that have the money for tires, when they're finished with their tires, I and my little tire guy, we're running around. Hey, what are you going to do with those tires? How many laps are on them? 40 laps? Okay, hold on, those are almost dangerous. I'll be back. Hey, what are you gonna do with those tires? How many laps are, 20, 20 laps? I can get 20 more laps out of these. Hold on, I'll be right back. My husband works for a team. Baby, what you got? <laughs> he sees us coming. 
I got a set of 10 lap tires. And so my tire guy and I were like, all right, we'll take those 10 lappers, we'll take those 20 lappers. And somebody says, uh, you know, if we're lucky, I've got five laps on my tires, I'll sell them to you for $200. Perfect. This is every single week. This is how I have to go racing. It would be so much easier if I just had the money to flop down the credit card and say, put $15,000 tires on my tab, please. But I can't do that. And so what that means, that's just one of the many, many areas that we are at a fraction of the money of some of our competitors. And so sometimes we beat those guys. Sometimes we beat them because they're stuck in the wall, but that's not my fault. I beat them. <laughs> And sometimes, you know, we just, we look stupid. We're slow. We're pathetic. Last week was terrible. Friday was, past two weeks have been really, really bad. I thought, how am I going to go be a motivational speaker when I need some motivation right now? Because <laughs> times have been really rough. But I'm telling you, to get out and to talk about it and to remind myself and to see that video and, and to just see what this, you know, career has gone through and what we have come through. And so... I really believe that there's a purpose in everything. And I believe, I used to say, and I don't want I don't want to come across like the wrong way, and I don't want to say that like I'm going to struggle forever. But I think that God gave me the desire and the ability to stand in front of groups of people and speak. And be, and so I think that He also gave me this ability to overcome adversity. And those go hand in hand. You overcome the adversity, you go out, you talk about it, and you teach people that it can be done. And so you may not, you know, you may look and, and say, oh, I want to be a race car driver. Well, when you have $15,000 a race to spend on tires, then you can go race in NASCAR. Or, you know what? You can take the used tires and you can go out there and you can do the best you can. Attention the embassy, attention on Kata. The time is now 1900. All personnel planning to stay after hours must contact Post 1 at extension 6666. I say again, all personnel planning to stay after hours must contact Post 1 at extension 6666. Thank you. We're staying a little bit longer. <laughs> uh, I think we have to be out of here by 8, right? Um, so, so yeah, So I, I, just, I really believe that as you journey, I, I, you're, you wouldn't be here tonight if you weren't a dreamer. Or maybe you're a race fan. <laughs> but you wouldn't be here tonight if you didn't want to get out and, and maybe try to take some motivation from somebody. So I really hope that I can provide that. And I'm telling you, like I tell all of the students that I speak to, I hope no matter your age, makes me very angry when people think that because you're a certain age that it's coming to a close or it's too late. There's a saying, it's never too late to be who you were meant to be. It's never too late. Age is not an excuse. But I hope that you know and learn how to fail forward. This is a good business saying that we have in, in, the, in the States. It's all over the business magazines. All these business leaders use it. Somebody should probably get credit for making the term up. But failure is part of life. Do you agree? It's part of life. The question is, what are you going to do with the failure? I would just like to give you two more examples of how I failed brilliantly forward. One is, just a couple years ago, I was at the Miami Speedway, and I have two, I own two, I own about seven race trucks, but two of them compete at the same time. Both of my trucks had blown engines in them. Literally at the start of the race, both trucks were being pushed by tow trucks back to the garage area and didn't make one laugh in the race. It was really, really pathetic, right? Oh, I better tell you about some of the good times, too. We'll get back to that. <laughs> but both of the trucks, okay, so I get out and I'm like, it's the last race of the season. It's been a long year. I'm like scratching my head and I'm looking and I'm like, is there any oil under here? Get back up. And there's this couple standing in front of me and I'm like, Oh hi, well, you know, how you doing? What do you need? Can I help you? And this guy starts talking to me with this thick German accent. And he says, Well, hello, you know, I'm a NASCAR Euro series team owner. And I was like, Europe? Oh, I would love to race in Europe. That sounds so cool. And he says, Yeah, he goes, Well, let's talk about it. Well, no team owner wants you to race without you bringing them a bunch of money. That's why I'm a team owner. People can bring me money to raise my race cars, uh, but it helps the team get stronger. 
So I took his card and he emailed me and he's like, hey, I thought we were going to talk about racing in Europe. And I'm like, yeah, you know, yes, sir. It's very nice to meet you. Thank you. And then a couple months later, like, hey, you haven't gotten back to me. Like, are, do you want to race in Europe or not? And I said, listen, any amount of money that I have, I really have to put in my team, blah, blah, blah. Long story short, I'm racing in Valencia, Spain. The first time I'd ever been to Spain. My husband's from Mexico City. It's the first time he had ever been to Europe. And next thing you know, I'm racing the NASCAR Euro Series. If I hadn't blown those engines, if I'd be out there on the racetrack running around in circles like I do every single week. But instead, I had this opportunity to do this dream bigger than NASCAR in the United States. You don't know how many people in the United States think it's so cool that I was racing in Europe. And then that has just grown to more and more opportunities. Sometimes, you know, things happen. I, I, I would like to say that I'm here because of some sort of adversity, and maybe I am. But my contact that brought me here, his name is Damien. And he asked me last year to go speak in the country of Georgia. And so now, aside from being an international race car driver, to be an international public speaker is just beyond anything that I could ever dream. And I just want you to think back to all the times that I could have, maybe should have, or would have quit. But something kept me going. And so if you have a business, a big dream, something you're pursuing, just remember that those hard times, those failures, are actually what are going to propel you forward. It might not be because there's some team owner or some opportunity standing there. It might just be because you need to build the strength. And you build that strength. How does a muscle build its strength? By breaking down. When you do squats, the gym, your muscle, you're ripping your muscle, you're tearing it. And the next day you feel it, it's screaming at you. But if you don't feel that pain, you're not going to get stronger. And I believe that that happens internally as well. It happens with your thoughts, it happens with your body, it happens all around. So you have to learn how to work through that. It's in business, it's in life, it's in anything that you want to do. I want to take a moment because when you ask a question, I like to be able to give long answers basically. And I want to make sure that we leave enough time at the end. I have autograph cards. And I want to make sure that each of you gets an autograph card if you'd like one and a photo. So I'd like to take 15 minutes or so right now and see if you have any questions. And then from those questions, I'll be able to maybe talk a little bit more about things that actually interest you. Because I've been racing for 29 years. And I could probably go on and on with racing stories. But I'm not quite sure which ones would relate the best to you or not. Uh, so through your questions, I'll get to know a little bit more about what intrigues you or, or what I can maybe share with you. Questions? Yes, sir. Um, thank you very much. Uh, Do you mind? Thank you. Uh, uh, James Cameron uh, said that uh, failure is an option. Failure. Oh, I think mine should. Yours <laughs> No, we'll share. Uh, no, no, okay. I, 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 again. Yeah, I failure is an option. James Cameron said that failure is an option, not a fear. Well, but. Uh, you, you don't fear of, uh, of, of, of failure in your career, but are you afraid of any accident or rage on the track? He, he asked if I'm afraid of any accident um, you know, on the racetrack. And here's what something that I learned from another race car driver a long time ago, because I would really say no. I mean, I would, no, I'm not afraid of getting hurt. But what I think is more accurate is I respect the fact that I can get hurt. And that means that I have to be really diligent about my safety. So when my dad first put me in a race car, he pulled the belts tight. And he said, are your belts tight? Are they OK? And I said, oh, yeah, Dad, they're comfortable. He goes, they're comfortable? I said, yeah. Pull them even tight. And I go, Dad, I can't breathe and that hurts. He goes, OK, good. Now they're tight enough. Go. And so you have to be diligent about that. When a big famous race car driver, his name is Dale Earnhardt, he passed away. After he died, we started to have to use these, um, we call them Hans device, and it's like a horseshoe goes around your neck, and it tethers to your helmet, so that if you get in a wreck, it keeps you, know, keeps you from stretching. I mean, you hit the wall head on at 200 miles an hour, bad things are going to happen, and so, through those accidents, through those really tragedies, uh, we've learned how to make things safer. So now there's such fewer 
like many, much less injuries, much less injuries now than there used to be. So I respect that it can happen. There can be a mistake, you know, anything can happen. But I feel very confident in our safety and I have hit a lot of walls <laughs> and I've walked away from every single one of them. Been on fire a few times, as you saw, and walked away from every single one of that. And what's interesting about it is when I see it after the fact, I go, oh, wow, that's crazy. But when you're in the race car and you're in the moment, you're so well protected. And some of the ways that we're protected is, for example, there's a race car is built in three sections. So there's the center section that for some reason it's called a greenhouse. And then there's a front clip. And these are all bars. So it's like a cage, right? So you're enveloped in a cage. And then there's a body that goes over it. And then there's the front section. They call it the front clip. And then there's the rear section. They call it the rear clip. So all of your suspension somehow mounts to these steel tubes and bars. And your fuel cell goes in a hole in the rear. Well, they designed these. When you see a race car all crunched up, that's a good thing. Because that means all those bars, they're crisscrossed, they all have a purpose. From every angle that you could hit that wall, scientists have studied so that the steel bars absorb the impact and your body does not. So the more mangled the race car looks, oh, that's good. Because it did its job and it crushed. Does that make sense? So I have a lot of faith in the safety and the technology and the time and things, people way smarter than I am that work really hard every day to keep us safe, especially in NASCAR. Thank you very much. Of course, I wish you only good luck, but I like steel and after, after some accidents, after some failures, I was afraid of the next attempts. Oh, I understand. Course, and you're saying skiing? Do you say skiing? Yes, I'm deathly afraid of skiing. You should see me try to ski. I'm, it's a dangerous sport, sir. You should be afraid. I'm serious. But, but you're right. And thank you very much for your question and your sentiments. Yes, sir. Did you have a question? Yeah. Oh, just a scratch. No, I'm joking. Yeah. Yes. Thank you very much for your very interesting speech. And I'm curious if it's still harder for women to break into the major racing leagues like NASCAR, IndyCar, or F1. Thanks. Thank you. Um, it's a great question. Did everybody hear him? Is it harder for women to break into, and you mentioned all of the racing. Um, I was asking Dennis today. Dennis is, has been my guide, and he's now my best friend in Moscow. And, <laughs> um, and so we've spent just 24 hours um, from the time I got to the airport through, through tonight. And I was asking Dennis, I said, you know, tell me if I'm too bold here. You know, I said, are, are women bold? Like, do women, like if a man kind of bumps into me, can I bump back? <laughs> you know? <laughs> I'm just kidding on that part, but you know, like, like what, what, what are the sentiments of women? And he said, no, I think it depends on the woman, you know, there's very strong women, right? And I said, you know, yeah, there are. And, and what I, I said, but I think in what I do, I think that men love for women to be women. Like, I think that men love for, you know, I, I love high heels, men love that I love high heels, you know? <laughs> um, and when I started racing, I was, my dad's name is Joe, I was Joe Cobb's daughter. Ah, oh, Joe Cobb's daughter's race. Yeah, look out, look out for her. They're good people. Her dad's good people. Well, when I started winning, uh-uh. I, I was not, that was not acceptable. They stuck, people that were nice to me for so long weren't nice to me anymore. So I think that, you know, the idea was I love racing against women. Oh, I, I don't want to be beat by a woman. You know, in the U.S., I think, like, we accept it. But as soon as the woman started doing well, oh, it's because of this, and it's because of that, and it's because she's a woman. And there's people, I mean, I have been an owner and a driver in the big leagues of NASCAR for almost 10 years. And I had a professional television reporter foolishly do an article, like a TV, that said that uh, some people think the only reason that I'm making it or continue to be in NASCAR is because of my looks. I'm like, I'm 46 years old. Thank you if you think I'm pretty, but that ship has sailed. I work my butt off and people see that I work my butt off and nobody in NASCAR even thinks that. And so it, it's, you know, women have to put up with, even if it's accepted, 
which I believe in NASCAR, it definitely is, but we still have to put up with really stupid things. And I said earlier that if uh, I hit the wall a couple weeks ago, I started this like whole tragedy of the past two weeks have been rough, but I hit the wall and I said, you know, I, I don't wreck very often, I really don't. Um, it's just that, you know, it's interesting when I do, so we talk about that more. But when I hit the wall, I said, people will say, oh, that girl, that girl, the girl hit the wall. Hey, 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 the girl hit the wall. But if anybody else on the racetrack hits the man, that driver hit that wall. Mm -hmm. Right? And, and, and I mean, I, I don't blame. We're different still, you know. And the best advice I ever got was from a um, fellow racer. His name was Andy Hellenberg. And we were sitting in the garage area at the Kansas Speedway on a tire. Just a real casual conversation. And I forget a lot of things. I say it's either the walls that I hit or the wine, I don't know, but I forget a lot of stuff. But I will, my best friend here is the only one that got my joke. <laughs> but but uh, he said to me, he said, Jennifer, he said, I'm going to tell you something. He said, you're going to get a lot of attention being a woman in this sport and a lot of good things and a lot of, you know, maybe some sponsors, maybe some media, you know, you're really going to get noticed in a good way in the sport. And he said, and you're going to have a really hard time. He said, you know, they're going to talk about you. You're going to get down. You know, sometimes it's just a lonely feeling. Like nobody understands what I'm going through. I'm so different. You know, I can't tell these guys about, you know, some of the feelings that I have because if we think differently. He said, so you're going to have some really bad things happen here and some really good things happen. And he said, what you should do is consider it a wash. So when the good things happen, just take it and carry on and, and you know, kind of ignore it, do what you can with it, but, but don't count on it. And when the really bad things happen, same thing, just throw it out. Just consider it a wash. And that was really kind of the best advice that, that I had ever gotten. When bad things happen, I remember that also sometimes good things happen because of it. I believe um, in the NASCAR Euro Series, the women that race in that series are amazing women, and I see them just very well respected. I don't have a personal experience with, say, Formula One, um, but I have definitely heard things, and it's not really um, open to women. Like, you know, this is a this is a problem. It seems like, and the University of Michigan had me asked me to participate in a study a couple of years ago because it was um, proving wrong a myth that somebody in Europe said that women physically couldn't be race car drivers physically couldn't do it. I don't, you know, strength, temperature, and we all participated in this study. Um, we had to swallow a, a pill that measured things on our inside, kind of weird, and um, wore heart rate monitors, and you can see the study. I posted it on my uh, Facebook page, on the Jennifer Joe Cobb Racing Facebook page a few weeks ago, and, um, you know, just proved it wrong. And so I am actually, I'm really proud to be part of motorsports in an era where we're still showing people. And, you know, we're, maybe we're winning, maybe we're losing. Um, there were three girls in my race last Friday. None of us did very well. And I'm like, oh gosh, I hate that. Oh, you know, I'd rather see one of the other girls do really well. But there was probably five guys that didn't have a good weekend either, right? And so I think that we just really have to stop thinking in those terms. But even I do it. It's difficult, okay? We're just, we're, we're born a certain way, we're taught a certain way. But I think that at the end of the day, if we can just respect one another, and hey, if you can do it, do it. My dad always told me that race car doesn't know whether you're a boy or a girl. It doesn't know, and that's what matters. But it can't know. Who? The race car driver, or the race car itself, can't know. Nope. <laughs> Any questions on the race? Yes, sir. Uh, Jennifer, thank you for sharing your wonderful experience with us. And I'd uh, like to ask you, uh, what are your main uh, goals for the nearest future, maybe to accomplish maybe some trophies, the development of business, or something else? Please share with us. Thank you. Thank you. What are my main goals in the near future? Um, so they just did a big article on NASCAR.com uh, on the internet of the fact that I was coming to Russia to speak. And what I really said there is, as a team owner, I want to continue to grow my team. I want to continue to make it better. I want Maybe I can start buying two sets of new tires in the near future. <laughs> um, so I would love to grow my team 
into two trucks at the same time on the track that are well funded. I think that would just be an, an awesome experience to be able to have the right equipment to be able to win a race. I do still dream about winning a race. Um, one of the articles that I read recently, just today as a matter of fact, it said that I was content. And I didn't really like that word, I'm sure I said it. I, you know, like I'm content doing what I do, I love my life, I love my job, I love what I do, but I wanna do better. So I want to be a better race car driver, I want to be able to focus more on the driving part and a little bit less on paying the bills and worrying about the bills and yelling at the employees. Um, and, and, to, and to be a better driver, I am learning the thing about racing in Europe is it the road courses. So do you know what I mean? You know, it's right, left, a circuit, right? In the US, it's everything that I've done is round and round and round and round as fast as you can go. And it's very thrilling and it's very exciting because it's a lot faster. I'd rather go 200 miles an hour than, you know, 130 miles an hour. I have to turn right and left and right. But it's something new. And at 46 years old, I think it's awesome that I'm getting new opportunities. And it's humbling because you don't know what the heck you're doing. <laughs> and so you're learning. But the, uh, you, you guys know Cher. I, I go by saying so much. I love sayings. So Cher said, uh, it, she said, don't be afraid to look stupid sometimes. And so I come over to Europe and I, I'm, I'm on my goals. I went to the sand. Sorry, sorry about your sand. You know, because I missed the corner. And then I get back out and next thing you know, I finished, you know, 16th in the race. So uh, it's all about learning. And again, you know, learning from that failure, learning from being in the sand pit, like, okay, don't go in the sand, you're not getting back out very quick, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. But, um, and so I want to continue to grow, to learn, to do better, to have better performance for my teams, to nurture other drivers, and to have a second driver be part of my team, and for us both, you know, to be good teammates and continue driving. But I also love doing the speaking. I hope that I can find, you know, better words to bring across the world. And I always say, um, I'm not the best speaker in, in the world, you know, I'm just not. Um, oh, you're so nice. <laughs> but I refuse to study, I refuse to like be structured. I just kind of like to talk and, and feel what you're feeling and talk about what I think you want to talk about. I don't have this like, okay, number one, this is what you're going to do for success. I love those guys. I love watching those speeches. But I just don't have that. And so when I get here, I prepare nothing. I'm like, okay, Dennis, tell me about my audience. Tell me what they're thinking. You know, tell me what their biggest challenges are. And one of the things that we talk about, especially when I come to this area and to Georgia, is are you too content? Are you content? He's a, he, we should have used our interpreter. <laughs> um, but you know, are you too comfortable in your life? Are you just making enough money? And you know, uh, to me, life is not about money. I live a lifestyle as if I'm rich and flying all over the world. I don't make a lot of money. I still struggle to pay my bills sometimes. Every once in a while, I avoid that phone number that you know the bill collector, you know? Every once in a while, things happen but I'm living the life of my dreams. If I, I had a, a sponsor, they didn't sponsor me, but they were like, if you ever stop racing, will you please come work for us? Because we think you would do a great job and we'll pay you a lot of money. And every once in a while, I'm like, so this week was hard. Maybe, you know, I'll call them. And then of course I remember, you know, no. Yes, yeah, so we'll, we'll just keep digging. So more speaking, I hope, more racing, new things like let's learn something new and continue to be challenged and not become content not become complacent or comfortable yes sir oh it's interesting he said what do you think about the future of electric cars in, in our sport um the only reason i know anything about this is because i raced against a guy that's friends with my husband named nelson pk jr i don't know if there's any formula one fans in here um, Nelson Piquet Jr., I don't know anything about his Formula One racing, but he could throw a really good party, I'll tell you that. So, um, but he started racing, when he left the truck series in the U.S. in NASCAR, he started racing the electric cars. There's a Formula electric circuit. Um, and I think it's interesting. I, I'm intrigued by it. I'm 
love the smell of fuel. I love the smell of burnt rubber. You know, I, I grew up in the 70s and the 80s and muscle cars and carburetors. And it's only been two years that the cars that I drive have a fuel injection system versus a carburetor. And it's so funny, the things that we had to learn. You know, you start the race car completely different with a fuel injection system versus a carburetor. So there's, there's a, a, a lot of little differences. For me, if it becomes better for everyone and it goes fast, I'm pretty okay with it. I hope it's still loud, but I'm pretty okay with it. <laughs> Actually, you know, they put speakers to make the sound of the engine. Oh gosh, yeah. see, there's, that, there's a part of me that thinks that's a little wrong. <laughs> that's a little wrong. Uh, the NASCAR Euro cars are pretty quiet compared to our cars. And a lot of times, um, whenever we just start our engines to get ready for the race, I'll put on Facebook Live and I'm like, okay guys, just have this moment with me. We're gonna fire it up, especially in February when we first get started. We race basically from February to November, mid-February to mid-November, so 10 months out of the year. And you would think in January, like we're so deprived of our engine sound and smells and things like that, so we can't wait to get the, the car or the truck fired up and get ready for our biggest race of the year, which is Daytona. So I'm happy to take another question, but I think we should also maybe um, break off now and if you want to kind of relax and a, a few at a time, just come up and we can do pictures and autograph, then um, if that's fine with you, then we'll do that, okay? It's really, really an honor to be here and I am amazed that you guys would want to come out and just see this girl from Kansas babble on stage. <laughs> um, so I really appreciate you. If you ever want to watch our races, they can watch online, right? Yes. Um, Every single one of my races is televised on a website called Fox Sports Go. I think maybe the problem with that website is you might have to have a, a, a login for it. But on NASCAR.com, they have been uh, broadcasting a lot of our races or our practices. And so if you're ever interested, you know, I would be honored if you would tune in. Tune in on a good night, okay? I'm trying to think of when that might be. <laughs> So is a business trip or tourist, so um, I, I would say technically if you work for the um, the guy that stamps my passport, I'm a tourist. <laughs> but th this is, a, you know, I am solely here to speak to groups like you um, in Moscow, in Rostov-on-Don, in Nizhny Novgorod. <laughs> In uh, Chilevinsk. 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 Did I say that? Chilevinsk. Yes. Okay. Wow. I think that it's very um, proper anywhere I go. I appreciate the world speaking English. I really do. And um, I think that we can become so self centered. I'm trying to learn Spanish because my husband and his family are from Mexico City. Most of his family still lives there. Um, and I do think that when you learn that second language, the third one becomes just a little bit easier and so on. But I think that it's very important, wherever you go, that you should at least know how to say hello and thank you. And so what I say to you is, spasibo. Okay.